All right. Uh, we're about to start our fourth webinar of the Week of Inclusive Action for LGBTQ Sex Education. Uh, my name is Noelle Summers. I am the current policy fellow at Zikis. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I'm so excited to be here with all of our amazing panelists today. Um, the plan is to talk about state level policy for inclusive LGBTQ sex education. Um, so we'll be talking through the 2020 legislative session um, and beyond to explore how states have tried to erase queer and gender expansive identities, unfortunately. Um, so we'll be exploring policies that impact LGBTQ youth, um, talk about how they frame the context that sex education occurs within, uh, as well as highlight the importance of sex education as a vehicle for social change. Um, we've got Anna Hernandez, who's a policy analyst at Equality Federation, to kind of talk us through the session. Um, in this role, she tracks and analyzes bills in the state on a broad range of issues affecting LGBT people, the quality federation can pull resources to and develop the advocacy of their partners on the ground. Um, and we also have Julia Walensky from the National Center for Lesbian Rights. She's the staff attorney there. And her work focuses on uh, litigation and advocacy to ensure the equal treatment of LGBTQ people in a lot of contexts. And she's going to talk about some really cool work that she was part of uh, in South Carolina and some other states. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Thank you so much, Noelle, and to Sikus also for seeding this week of action and for the invitation to join you and Julie today. Um, so yeah, Equality Federation is essentially the strategic partner to state-based organizations that advocate for LGBTQ plus people. We leverage policy expertise and also our long-standing relationships with our member organizations to support them as they prepare for and respond to every legislative milestone along the way, whether it's from committee hearings all the way to signing ceremonies. Um, next slide, please. So actually, I think, yeah, there we go. As part of that work, we track LGBTQ related legislation in all 50 states, which amounts to several hundred bills per year so that we can provide advocates on the ground with the organizing, messaging and policy resources that um, might be useful to them. This is a screenshot of our bill tracker, which you can access on our website equalityfederation.org. Generally speaking, we organize the bills that we're watching by state and by theme. Um, some of these themes, like education, are by nature primarily about LGBTQ plus youth. When I say youth, I am talking about the legal definition of who's a minor, which differs somewhat by state. Uh, each state mandates an age of majority, somewhere between 18 and 21 years old, and people who haven't reached that age yet are considered minors. Next slide, please. So clearly most bills we track, of course, will impact LGBTQ plus youth, even if it's not, they're not explicitly about them. So for example, bills that mandate non-discrimination in public accommodations, which includes places like restaurants, libraries, food banks, movie theaters, of course affect LGBTQ plus people of all ages. But some bills really are quite specifically about LGBTQ plus youth. And so for purposes of today, we're gonna to focus here. Um, at Equality Federation for the past few years, these include bills that are about conversion therapy, family and education. And then within each of these themes, there are bills that promote LGBTQ plus equality and bills that would reinforce discrimination and invisibilization. So taking education bills as an example, within those that were introduced this last session, there were those that seek to establish inclusive curriculum, which means to teach about the existence and the roles and contributions of LGBTQ plus people in history, politics, uh, arts, governance, and so on. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have bills like the one that we saw in Arizona just this past session that tried to make it so that no public school could require a teacher, administrator, or any staff person really to refer to a student by any gender or pronouns that aren't reflected directly on the student's birth certificate. I do want to be clear that for purposes of today, I'm going to focus on the uglier end of that spectrum. Um, Noelle and Julie will thankfully write that ship. 
uh, but I hope that you'll bear with me. I would invite you to do what you need for the next 15 minutes or so to help you receive information about the various kinds of attacks on LGBTQ plus youth that play out still in state legislatures across the country. Most notably in 2020, we witnessed a surge in our counts of anti-LGBTQ plus bills, the vast majority of which were bills that specifically target transgender and non-binary youth. One set of these bills sought to ban affirming healthcare for these youth, and then the other to prohibit trans and non-binary athletes from participating in sports that fit their gender identity. Next slide, please. By a conservative count, there were more than 120 anti-LGBTQ plus youth bills that were introduced this past session. You'll see in a minute why I say that this is a conservative count. Um, more than half of these anti-bills were those same bills that target transgender and non-binary youth, again, by attempting to ban access to affirming health care and by attempting to ban these youth's participation in sports in schools. But what do these other anti-bills look like? In the theme of conversion therapy, uh, these included bills that didn't condemn and ban the practice outright. Some of these bills provided exemptions for religious and faith leaders, parents and grandparents. So in other words, these individuals could still practice conversion therapy on LGBTQ plus youth in their community or their family. Other versions of these bad conversion therapy bills um, only ban certain practices like electroshock treatments. And then some other ones actually try to protect conversion therapy by prohibiting efforts to pass laws to ban it. Um, a ban on a ban, you could call it. In the theme of family, these anti-LGBTQ plus youth bills included bills that prohibited the state from, quote, discriminating, unquote, against the adoption or foster care agency that might provide services according to the agency's religious or sincerely held beliefs. That means that LGBTQ plus youth who are um, in their custody could, for example, be denied placements in affirming homes or be placed with people who would subject them to conversion therapy or just other forms of um, abuse and neglect, essentially. Other bills sought to restate parents' rights over the education, care, and religious and moral instruction of their children, which can conflict with the rights of kids and youth to affirming and nurturing care, including when it comes to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and that third theme of education is one place where it's especially clear why this count, this 120 plus bills that I'm talking about, is actually a very conservative count. This past session, we saw several bills introduced that tried to embed religion in public education, like those that authorize Bible studies classes or permit religious activities like um, prayer groups and that kind of thing during the school day. Our concern, of course, is that religion can be misused as a means to discriminate against LGBTQ plus people, including to limit or deny access to comprehensive and affirming sex ed. We watch these bills, but they're not included in our count today, except for versions of the Forum Act. Slight tangent here. A Forum Act tells public colleges and universities that they can't deny benefits to student groups that require leaders to uphold certain beliefs. Um, the reason that I'm including this kind of bill is that it became law in Iowa recently, I think it was in 2019, between two different court cases that decided two different student groups, one being business leaders in Christ and the other one is called InterVarsity, um, that these two different student groups could deny their LGBTQ plus members leadership positions because LGBTQ identity is counter to the beliefs, you know, written into the rules and regs of these different groups. So basically that portion of bills, the 20% of youth bills in education includes forum act bills 
which do not name LGBTQ plus youth specifically, but have a documented history of being used to discriminate. The other kinds of anti-youth bills in this education theme includes those that require schools to inform parents and maybe even require that parents pre-file written permission for students before the students can receive anything about sexual orientation and gender identity. And by anything, uh, some of the things listed included contact information for supportive services, brochures, um, quote, exposure to displays, unquote, meaning notice of a GSA meeting or something like that, classes, participating in surveys, anything that basically references or even hints at <laughs> a discussion about, again, sexual orientation and gender identity. Other types of anti-bills in this education realm um, are specifically anti-trans in that they are those bathroom bills for schools. Do you remember the bathroom bills of just a few years ago that tried to prohibit transgender people from using public facilities that correspond to gender identity. A few other bills sought to create inclusive curricula, but we count them as anti when they include sexual orientation, but do not include gender identity and expression. And then finally, there's that bill in Arizona that I mentioned earlier that is really quite honestly just mean. Um, but let's take a closer look at these bands, these, these big groupings of anti-bills that we saw this past session. Next slide, please. So 18 states introduced 32 bills to ban affirming health care for trans and non-binary youth. Um, this attack was so egregious and so widespread that it made headlines in mainstream news all over the country. Here's one headline from USA Today. It was covered also in Time Magazine, The Economist, CNN, many others. These bills emerged from a toxic mix of backlash to uh, LGBTQ plus advocates' defeat of those bathroom bills in 2016 and 2017 followed immediately by advocates' enormous successes in then passing dozens, if not hundreds, of local and statewide laws um, on non-discrimination. And then also the galvanized energy in our opponents that was generated by enormous conservative news coverage of an ongoing, really ugly custody battle in Texas um, for a young transgender girl and her twin. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I <laughs> have tons of information and I'm happy to like walk you through, you know, how that's transpiring and actually still ongoing. But anyway, um, most of these bills on banning affirming health care specified that they ban surgeries, mastectomies, removal of quote, otherwise healthy, unquote, tissue and hormone therapies. Most also ban puberty blockers. Um, almost half provided an exemption for minors with intersex traits, but notably did not require these minors consent for uh, this kind of medical services. In the absence of the minor's consent, these same medical interventions do not serve as vital healthcare services, but instead as tools of coercion and abuse. At the same time that these bills are banning these services, except for intersex, uh, kids with intersex traits, Several of these bills stated that the provision of affirming care of this kind for transgender youth does constitute child abuse. So anyway, a lot of direct contradiction and irony, I guess you could call it, in these bills. The majority sought to criminalize the provision of care, with most holding the health care providers directly responsible. Most bills classified violations as a felony or misdemeanor and several also provided that violations would be prosecuted as child abuse. Many imposed penalties in the form of discipline by the licensing board, uh, suspension or revocation of the provider's licenses and fines. I would add that denying affirming medical care, we saw also that it cross cuts with certain interpretations of freedom. Uh, five other bills that are not counted here 
prohibited the state from taking, again, that discriminatory action against any person who refuses gender affirming medical care to anyone on the basis of the provider's sincerely held religious or moral conviction. Um, and in these ways, like while these are not outright bans, they, these bills do seek to create and protect a right to endanger the health and well-being of all transgender people by permitting denial of care. Next slide, please. So on the athlete bans, 19 states introduced 34 bills to ban transgender student athletes from participating in school-sponsored sports in ways that affirm who they are. Um, if you're interested in hearing, this is a shameless plug moment, <laughs> more about the healthcare and athlete bans, I would invite you back to the website, our website, equalityfederation.org, to watch the recording of a conversation between Alok, who is billed as an artist, but who is also an extraordinary political and cultural analyst, and Equality Federation's own Vivian Topping. So these athlete bans, emerged from a toxic mix of the same backlash I just described, the same successes by LGBTQ plus advocates in passing non-discrimination laws, and a different ongoing court case filed in Connecticut in order to prohibit transgender student athletes, in this case runners, from participating on teams and in competitions in ways that correspond to gender identity. We're back on slide, thank you. <laughs> Um, most of these bills targeted only transgender girls and women, usually under the guise of claiming to protect women and girls' rights as represented under Title IX of the Education Act amendments. These bills either ban transgender athletes from girls' and women's school sports, or they prohibit adverse action by the state against schools that sponsor events, teams, and sports that are exclusively for female students. So in other words, the state can't file suit, can't deny them grants or contracts and things like that um, for having these, these discriminatory systems and measures in place. Nearly all these bills impose definitions or criteria as to who qualifies as girl, female, or woman. Um, these criteria and attempts to define include references to biological sex or birth certificates, including references to original birth certificates without revisions or amendments with respect to sex, which if you know anything about the birth certificate laws is just, those don't exist. The original birth certificate is um, the one that the person has in hand, not, not anything else basically. Um, other bills have included requirements for medical proof, which, as described, was, is extraordinary, elaborate, and invasive. It's comprised most commonly of a signed medical professional's statement attesting to the student's sex based on exams, physical exams of internal and external reproductive anatomy, and also tests of their testosterone levels, and genetic makeup. Most of these bills held the schools directly accountable um, for you know, uh, implementing this law, either by requiring that they establish sex segregated systems and by extension, the mechanisms that are necessary to isolate and exclude transgender girls and women, or else by banning schools, colleges, and universities from participating in athletic events that are organized by any association with a transgender inclusive policy. A few of these bills did threaten to cut public funding or even to bring civil action against individuals like you know, school administrators, coaches, and so on, if a school or university would violate this law. But most bills, instead of imposing sanctions, went and reframed the requirement for schools to discriminate against transgender athletes as a right. And they do so by saying not only that schools are protected from adverse action for doing these discriminatory things, but also that any school or student that suffers harm as a result of somebody else violating the law could then file suit against the offending party. Um, it's, it's, 
it, it, it's a very convoluted way <laughs> of creating rights out of um, you know the requirement to discriminate basically I do want to make just a few editorial comments regarding these anti-trans youth bills um, so their advocates operate from a place of misogyny classism and white supremacy quite frankly we absolutely have to fight these battles where they surface but we also can't permit these frames to limit our own. So for example, with respect to the healthcare bans, we have to also name and decry how these bills rely on criminalization, which would require pouring, again, even more resources, power, voice, authority, status into a system that's been proven racist over and over. Uh, with respect to the athlete bans, the claims of protecting women and girls have long been used to control their behavior and to deflect from the fact that inequality, discrimination, violence, and not in this case transgender people are what constitute the real harms to women and girls. So these bills arguably advance misogyny in a lot of different ways. Bill proponents assume that trans youth have access to well-resourced schools and to expensive medical care. We have to defeat these bills and also advocate for equal access for every trans and gender non-binary young person, including those who are poor or in state custody, to these vital healthcare services, to and to sports, and all the benefits that come with sports. So in other words, Issues of racial and economic justice play out in education, healthcare, and sports policy. Um, these bills make it clear that anti-LGBTQ discrimination and oppression works in these areas also, but we have to be just as clear that access to healthcare and sports were really never just our issues, if you will. Next slide, please. So, LGBTQ plus advocates were engaged in intense struggles to defeat these bills and to their enormous credit were successfully holding them at bay. And then the coronavirus pandemic forced most state legislatures to abandon 2020 calendars. And these legislatures either just adjourned, like closed for the rest of the session, or they severely curtailed their activity very abruptly, starting in March for indeterminate periods of times. Um, those legislatures that stopped functioning for a while but didn't close out their sessions reconvene later in the spring but mostly to pass emergency measures and budgets but still two of these bad bills passed anyway the first was at the start of the session tennessee has a two-year legislative session and it opened its second year of the 2019-2020 session by immediately passing a law that creates a religious license to discriminate in adoption and foster care services. The second one that passed was during that in-between period when legislatures realized the coronavirus was gonna change everything, but before they shut down. So rather than focus on the public health emergency, Idaho's lawmakers chose instead to prioritize passing a law to codify discrimination against trans and non-binary student athletes. Um, the last thing I wanna say is that I would be remiss if I didn't say that the other measure of LGBTQ plus advocate success was that they, in addition to holding all of these bills at bay, they also passed many, many bills this past session that protect and ad advance the rights of LGBTQ plus youth in more places and in different ways, but that's of course the subject of a different conversation. Um, next slide, please. So thank you just for being here, for listening. Um, let me know if you have questions or want more information either at the end of our session together or send me an email. Thanks. So we had slight technical difficulty. So um, I've taken over control and I just passed it to you, Noel. So I believe you can advance. Let's see. I can, that's excellent. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much to Anna. I'm, I'm gonna unfortunately keep my video turned off because I'm having some struggles with my Wi-Fi. 
Um, you can hopefully still hear my voice as I talk through the next couple of things. Um, so Anna talked us through some of the really horrifying bills that were introduced, many of which fortunately did not pass, um, that were related to LGBTQ youth. And so I'm going to make the connection between sex education and these bills to talk about why folks who care about sex ed should care about these bills and should get more involved in state level advocacy. So we know that sex education doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, the environment that young people live in is a crucial consideration when we think about how we provide the best possible services to them. And the goal of sex ed is to ensure that all people have the information and skills they need to enjoy their sexual and reproductive health. That's why all of us do the work that we do. But what does that look like when the outside environment is hostile? Sex ed ends up getting watered down and washed out when these kinds of policies are implemented. So for example, we can talk about gender or affirming gender identity and expression and sexual orientation in the sex ed classroom. But if in the next period, young people are forced to choose between playing a sport that they love and living as their true selves, um, that message gets kind of mixed up and it gets further lost when folks go home to their communities and they see people who look like them denied access to family because of how they identify and who they love um, to create an even more direct connection. We can create curricula so that young people know all the kinds of health services and skills they could ever need to ensure that reproductive and sexual freedom. That's the goal of sex ed. But how helpful is that information when you can't access those services and practice those skills because legislators in your state have determined that affirming health care is a crime or is child abuse. So with these policies, we continue this long history of legalizing and enforcing the stigmatization of LGBTQ lives and we can fight back with sex education. At CECUS, we believe that sex ed creates social change. So through sex ed, we can challenge the harmful myths, stereotypes, and inequitable power structures that hurt LGBTQ people, especially LGBTQ youth of color who face oppression at the intersection of so many identities and face the highest rates of victimization at school and out in the world. And we can instead normalize, validate, and center the multitude of ways that people identify and express their gender and sexuality. And in doing so, we can move forward from this place where we're just trying to ensure that our society isn't impeding the progress of LGBTQ people to ensuring that they're thriving and loved because this in turn creates a healthier, more vibrant world where everyone can live free from the barriers that limit our potential. So right now these policies are doing the opposite. They're creating a more hostile culture that requires a bigger ask and a stronger lift from sex ed. And I think sex ed is up to the task, but we really need everyone, including sex educators, young people, their parents, their community members, to pull together and advocate in solidarity with LGBTQ youth for their right to sex education. So let's talk about what that looks like at the state level. Oops. Just popped out. Let's try to go back in. If you click at the very bottom. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. All right, so I'm coming from Missouri. I just finished up the legislative session there as an intern with a really awesome state representative. Um, and unfortunately for the 2020 legislative session, Missouri legislators decided to go big when maybe they should have just gone home. Um, they introduced 15 bills attempting to ban LGBTQ people from playing sports, from participating in club leadership, from accessing health care. They tried to bring back the bathroom bans. Um, just a bunch of horrifying things. Um, and what's even more horrifying than them being introduced at all is the fact that they actually started to move through the legislature. Um, so let's talk about what that looks like um, and do a little bit of a policy 101. So when I say that a bill is moving, um, I mean that just before a legislative session starts and then during the first month or so of the session, legislators will introduce bills in their respective chambers, so either in the House or the Senate. So someone in each chamber, either the Speaker of the House or the President pro tempore in the Senate or potentially a specific committee, it just depends on which state you're in, um, will introduce the legislation and then decide which committee they'll send the bill to. The committees are made up of a mixture of legislators from each political party and they're based around an area of policy. So that could be education, children, youth and families, the judiciary committees are where we started to see some of these different bills being introduced. Once the bill has been assigned to its relevant committee, the head of that committee then schedules a hearing for the bill. And during the hearing, people from the public, which is all of you, can come in and testify on the bill, either in support or against it, 
um, or just to provide information on the bill. Um, during the hearing, or after the hearing, the committee will vote to decide if they send that bill back to the original chamber, where then all the members of that House or Senate can discuss the bill, add amendments to it, and then pass it on to the next step. Um, and that process begins again. So if the bill starts in the House, it's then sent to the Senate, where it's assigned to committee, a hearing is scheduled, it's sent back to the Senate, um, and then it is eventually sent on to the governor to be signed into law. So there are a lot of different moving pieces here and lots of opportunities for bills to fall through the crack. So thousands of bills are introduced in such later centers every session, and the party in power gets to decide when and how to assign bills. They might wait until the last moment in a session to assign a bill they don't like to a committee, so it won't have a chance to become law. And likewise, if they do like a bill, they'll assign it to committee a lot faster, it'll get a hearing a lot faster, so that they can hopefully move it through and get it passed before the end of the session. Um, this process can happen at any step of the way with the legislators in power holding off on assigning bills or bringing them up for debate quickly. Um, but they also might just not know that a specific bill exists because there are so many of them or how important it is, which is where you all can get involved as activists and implement some strategies. So intervention at these different steps can look like different things. It's important to start paying attention to your session early so that you can see which bills you care about and want to influence or so that you can create a bill of your own and find a legislator to support it. If you go to your state legislature's website, you can both search for bills by keywords, you could type in sex education or LGBTQ, and see what bills currently exist around that topic and where they are in the legislative process. Likewise, if you don't see any bills that you're passionate about, you can see if you can find model policy language or get a group together to draft some of your own and talk with either your legislator or one who's passionate about your cause to have them sponsor the legislation. Once you figured that out, you can start to parse out your strategy. So at any of the previous steps that I just talked through, when the bill is introduced, when it's assigned to a committee, um, when it's on the floor of the House or Senate being discussed, you can call and email your legislators or the legislators who are on the committee to share your view of the bill. If you support it, oppose it, if you think parts of it need to change, whatever you think is important for the policymaker to know, you should tell them. Your legislators want and need to hear from you because they only have so much expertise in certain areas. They need to know exactly how these bills will affect you, their constituents, so that they can make the best possible decisions for their communities. If you see that a bill has been introduced but it's stalled, you can also call on leadership to move a bill, so assigning it to a committee, calling for a hearing on a specific bill, or specifically requesting that they bring it up for debate. Another really great way to intervene in the legislative process is to testify at a public hearing for a bill. In most states, legislators will give you a notification before giving a bill a public hearing. So it's really important to be paying attention to bills you care about from the beginning of a session because you might never know um, until 24 hours beforehand that a bill is going to be called up in a hearing. Um, if a bill gets a hearing, anyone can come and testify in support, in opposition, or just for information. And you might only have a couple of minutes to testify, so you need to be prepared to hit the most important facts in quickly. You may also be asked questions by the legislators once you've finished your testimony because you are a living expert and they can ask you questions to get more information about why they should or shouldn't pass the bill. So please be prepared to cite your sources. Um, watching previous sessions of testimony on similar bills or with the same legislators can help you prepare for potential questions and to just feel more comfortable giving testimony in general. Um, you can also join an organization for their lobby day, which means going to your state's capital and talking with legislators in person to build relationships and show decision makers either how many people support them or how many people are not fans of the work that they're doing. Taking action with an organization and as a group helps to create a more unified voice and it allows individuals access to things like training, support, and a community to lean on when advocacy can get a little bit tough. So that's kind of a bird's eye view of the different ways you can get involved in advocacy. And now that we've talked through that, let's talk about what it actually ends up looking like on the ground. Um, so like I said, I'm coming to you from Missouri after their 2020 session. Um, and I wanted to talk through these two bills as kind of case studies for what getting involved in advocacy can actually end up looking like. Um, and because I also think these two bills were some of the most toxic that we saw introduced in the Missouri legislature this session. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that in just a minute. So Missouri House Bills 1721 and 2051 were introduced in December and January. They were then referred to the Judiciary Committee in late January, which is 
pretty quick. It's only took a couple weeks for them to be introduced to a committee. And then pretty rapidly after that, they had a public hearing, which means that the folks um, in power in the Missouri legislature, which is the Republican party, were very interested in seeing these bills get passed. Um, both bills targeted gender affirming care like puberty blockers, hormone therapy, or any kind of surgery for the purpose of gender affirmation, as Anna talked us through. Um, 1721 would have caused any healthcare provider who gave any kind of gender affirming care to someone under the age of 18 to lose their license. And 2051 unfortunately went further and attempted to label the act of assisting anyone under the age of 18 in accessing gender affirming care as child abuse and neglect. So both are clearly untrue, they're wildly harmful, and they're not based in any kind of medical advice or best practice. They purely come from a place of fear and hatred and backlash against all of the amazing things advocates were able to get done um, in previous sessions. So fortunately, LGBTQ plus young people and their advocates were ready to go to defeat these bills in Missouri. We have some incredibly fierce organizers and they were able to help mobilize their communities in calling, emailing, and writing letters to prevent uh, these bills from moving at all. And unfortunately, when the bills were given a hearing, um, they were ready to go to mobilize folks to show up to testify against the bills. Um, and it's important to note here that showing up to testify is not an insignificant commitment in any way. It means getting yourself to your state's capital, which could be hours away from your home, and taking time off from work or school. So most legislators do understand this commitment and they're truly honored that people show up to participate in the political process and they're there to support you. Unfortunately, that's not true for all legislators. Um, the process is not always straightforward and respectful. So the hearing in this case was set for 4 p.m. on a Tuesday, so in the middle of the week. So folks interested in testifying had to take time off of work, they had to take time off of school um, to show up in Jefferson City in Missouri. Um, and they did. They showed up at Tuesday at 4 p.m. Um, and then they sat and they waited in the hearing room for over four hours as the Missouri House drew out their legislative session, most likely in an attempt to stall and outlast the folks who had come to testify. Um, as I mentioned before, it takes a serious commitment to show up in most states. Missouri is one of them. Jefferson City is several hours away from a lot of our major cities um, and communities. And so there were likely people who wanted to testify but couldn't stay until 9 p.m. when the committee finally began to hear testimony. Additionally, since the meeting started so late, the committee head gave each person only 30 seconds to share their story and to talk about what the bill meant to them. Um, despite all of these really horrifying tactics, folks were still able to stay and commit to making sure these bills did not move. And testimony lasted for over an hour, even though each person only had 30 seconds to share, um, which was truly incredible. So fortunately, the people of Missouri won. These bills stopped moving. They have not passed. You can still access gender affirming care if you're under the age of 18 in Missouri, um, which is amazing. I think the voices and stories of individuals are powerful and they're hard to ignore. And I truly believe that each young person who shared how the bills would hurt them provided nail after nail after nail in the coffin of these toxic bills. And honestly, they may have continued if young trans and gender expansive people and their communities didn't rally as hard as they did against these bills. So I do wanna pause here and recognize that it is no easy task to advocate for your right to exist. Um, and I personally believe that a society that forces its people to do so is creating violence against them. It is beyond traumatic to have to tell someone in power that you're worried that you and your friends will likely die because of the policies that person is considering. This is a huge ask and a lot of people cannot meet that ask because of their physical safety and health um, and needing to take care of their communities. And so I think it's incredibly important for those of us who have privilege to take on this work, even though it is hard and demoralizing and again traumatizing at times because the situation will become a lot worse if we choose to not leverage that privilege and to go silent. Um, so I want to end my contribution on a slightly more hopeful note by bringing the conversation back to the beginning with sex education as social change. We have the opportunity to build a society that does not commit this kind of violence against its people and policy change is a piece of that. In addition to fighting back against the bad bills, we also need to support young people as they advocate for sex education that not only includes but celebrates trans, gender expansive, and LGBTQ youth while they're alive, creating a culture where the bad bills are less and less likely to be introduced. 
that was kind of a quick summary of what you can do before a bill becomes a law, but what happens if a harmful bill is passed? So Julie Walensky from the NCLR is gonna to talk to us about defeating terrible policies after they've been put into place, because we will truly never stop fighting and the fight is never over. Great, thank you so much, um, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you to Sikas and uh, my fellow panelists, Anna and Noel. It's really great to be with you today and learn from you today. Um, I'm a senior staff attorney at the National Center for Lesbian Rights in San Francisco. And um, NCLR is the first national LGBTQ organization that was founded by women. And we work to advance the civil rights of LGBTQ people and our families through legislation, litigation, policy, and public education. And my work focuses primarily on litigation, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to um, talk today about anti-LGBTQ curriculum laws and some lawsuits that have successfully challenged them. Um, anti-LGBTQ curriculum is a is a mouthful, and these laws are often called um, no promo homo laws as a shorthand. And what they refer to um, are state laws that generally restrict the discussion of LGBTQ people in public schools. Um, these are not new laws. They um, were generally enacted in the late 1980s and early 1990s um, during the HIV epidemic at a time when states were enacting sex education and HIV education laws. And the purpose of these anti-LGBTQ laws is to just express moral disapproval of um, homosexuality. And there's a fascinating history of these laws and the legislative debates on them in a Law Review article um, by Professor Clifford Roski. Um, but I just wanted to provide a few examples of them. And so they generally are in the context of health and sex ed and HIV education. And um, the laws either prohibit or limit discussion of same-sex relationships, or they even require a negative or inaccurate portrayal of same-sex relationships. And so some of the examples on the slide is that in Alabama and Texas, sex ed must emphasize that being gay is not a lifestyle acceptable to the general public. That's a quote. And in Arizona, in HIV AIDS curriculum, instruction was not allowed to suggest that some methods of sex are safe methods of homosexual sex. And in South Carolina, the law was that in comprehensive health education, um, the discussion can't include anything about what they call alternate sexual lifestyles, including homosexual relationships, except during instructions, during instruction on STIs. So it was really limiting. You could only even mention, um, mention queer people when you're talking about disease. And the reason um, that there are stars and on the slides next to Arizona and South Carolina is that um, these laws are no, no longer able to be enforced um, due, to, due to litigation. And so that's the asterisk there. Um, five states still have similar laws, um, and that's Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, and Oklahoma. And the reason I wrote at least is that there are also a few states that don't explicitly limit the discussion of LGBTQ people, but they do require promoting um, heterosexual marriage. So for example, in Florida and Illinois, there's um, sex ed laws or regulations that say the curriculum should emphasize the benefits of monogamous heterosexual marriage. And um, as you can see on the slide, these laws were successfully challenged in Utah, Arizona, and South Carolina by lawsuits that we at NCLR and our partners brought to litigate them. Um, next slide, please. So these laws, um, even though these laws are very outdated and they sound quite archaic in their language, um, it's, these aren't just laws that sit there on the books not doing anything. They continue to harm students in real and concrete ways. And the slide shows three ways that they harm students. Um, and the first is that they single out LGBTQ students for unequal treatment in the classroom. 
And that's very stigmatizing. It creates an official climate of discrimination. And GLSEN has an issue brief on this that really lays out the data showing that students in states with these laws have more hostile school climates. They're at a higher risk of bullying and harassment and also have less access to other um, supports for LGBTQ students such as gender and sexuality alliances. And also um, students just feel erased when um, teachers are not allowed to answer their questions. And there's examples from this in the litigation that we brought. For example, students would ask questions during sex ed about same-sex relationships and teachers would say, oh, we can't really talk about that. Um, and also just bullying and harassment that happens in the context of sex ed. Um, for example, in South Carolina, since same-sex relationships could only be talked about during instruction on STIs, you know, we heard from a sixth grader whose classmate threw a Clorox wipe at him and told him he was diseased because that was the message that the school curriculum was, was sending. The second way that these laws are harmful is that, um, the second way is that the, the laws are harmful is that they undermine health education, in some cases even presenting, preventing the teaching of accurate information. So for example, in Arizona, um, because the HIV AIDS education wasn't allowed to say that there are any safe methods of same sex activity, then, um, then schools can't provide medically accurate information that's really critical for students' health and safety. And finally, the way that um, these laws are harmful, or another way that the laws are harmful is that schools and teachers would frequently misinterpret them to apply more broadly. So for example, in South Carolina, the law applied to health education, but um, teachers and schools often thought that it applied more broadly to prohibit other discussion of LGBTQ people in schools. And so one example that, um, there, that was, in the, was in the news is that some students at a high school made a video about um, transgender kids accessing restrooms consistent with their gender identity, which the principal then banned, um, supposedly based on this law um, that really just should have been limited to um, health education. And so um, uh, let's move to the next slide. So um, I'm just going to provide an overview of the litigation that's been brought to um, successfully challenge these laws. Um, NCLR has worked with wonderful partners and we and our teams have brought three successful lawsuits, one in Arizona, one in Utah, and one in South Carolina. And I just want to emphasize that we've, we have been working very closely with other state and local and national groups. And we could not do this work without our partners. In particular, uh, we worked with Equality Utah, we worked with Equality Arizona, we worked with South Carolina Equality Coalition, and many other groups, um, both local, state, and regional and national as well. Uh, the lawsuits were also brought after extensive outreach and investigation. So it's not just that we're looking at laws that as lawyers, when we see them, we know they're unconstitutional on their face, but how do they actually affect students? What is it like to be in sex ed and be subjected to this law? What is it like to be a teacher and be subjected to this? Um, and so we reviewed public records, other publicly available data, and then spent just a lot of time talking to students, teachers, parents, advocates, um, and other community stakeholders. I also wanna turn, um, to mention something that Noelle had, or her comment about privilege is that it really takes a lot to be in a to be in a lawsuit, especially for a kid who is a or a young person who is a middle school student or a high school student. And in order to um, be someone who's at the forefront in a lawsuit challenging a law like this, um, the kids that the young people that we've worked with have had really supportive families who are powerful advocates, not only for um, themselves, but for kids all over the state. And so um, it really takes a lot for young people to be, to stand up and be involved in this, especially when it's on uh, what can, what can feel like a really sensitive subject of um, sex ed and also their experiences in school. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk about two of the three lawsuits. I'm going to talk about the Arizona case and also the South Carolina case because they're the most recent. Um, so the, this slide talks about 
um, the case that we brought in Arizona, which is called Equality Arizona versus Hoffman. And um, as I mentioned, the, the law that we challenged was from, it was from 1991, and it applied um, specifically to HIV AIDS curriculum, and it prevented um, the curriculum from promoting homosexuality as a positive alternative lifestyle, and then the second, the other part about um, safe methods of homosexual sex, which is what the language in the law. And um, this is something that um, came about after many, many, many years of advocacy in Arizona by students, parents, teachers, legislators, school boards, and really a wide, a wide range of organizations. Um, and one example of that um, local advocacy is that the Phoenix Unified School District passed a resolution in 2015 that condemned the state law and said, our curriculum is not truly inclusive due to the state law and that our district will comply with the strict requirements of the law while working for inclusive change. And so that was one way that school districts that were subjected to this discriminatory law could publicly uh, register their opposition and try to have a more inclusive environment. Um, there were also years of legislative attempts to repeal the law and the bills just got blocked and weren't able to advance. And so um, every legislative session for a bunch of years in a row, lawmakers would introduce um, a bill to try to get this law off, taken off the books and uh, it would always face opposition um, in the legislature. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, please. So this is, uh, the photo here is Santi. They are a middle school student in Tucson. Uh, Santi is a um, non-binary trans identified teenager who likes knitting and Minecraft. And they stepped up to, do, to be involved in this lawsuit as a plaintiff so they could advocate for students across the state, which just takes incredible courage uh, for them to have put themselves out there and be in this position. Um, and we, the other plaintiff in the case was Equality Arizona, which is an advocacy group for the full equality of LGBTQ people in Arizona. And um, the legal claim in the case was under the federal constitution's guarantee of equal protection. And um, as I said earlier, these laws are just, they're facially unconstitutional. They single out a group of people for unequal treatment in the classroom. And that's not something that um, can pass muster under the law. Um, and just finally, when we uh, litigated the case, we collaborated uh, with Lambda Legal, a law firm Perkins Cooey, and Professor Cliff Roski, who's the author of the Law Review article I mentioned on the history um, of these laws. Um, next slide, please. Um, so an amazing development in this case is that two weeks after we filed the lawsuit, the legislature repealed the challenged law. And um, that is something that was um, surprising. We, so we didn't have to spend years tied up in litigation. Basically, we brought the suit, and then two, two weeks later, the law was off the books, which is a really amazing development. And um, there were many, many factors that contributed to this. But one important factor is that um, the state superintendent of education, who is the defendant in the lawsuit because of her official role, um, she, there, she, was, she had newly taken office several months before, and she agreed that the law was harmful and discriminatory. She recognized that this law harmed kids in Arizona and agreed. And so she did not want to defend this law. And the state attorney general also refused to come into the case and defend it. And so through the leadership of um, many people in Arizona, a bunch of forces combined to get this law repealed so quickly. And one surprising event was that um, the Center for Arizona Policy, which is a very influential um, conservative group, actually issued a public statement saying that they agreed that repealing the law is an appropriate response to the lawsuit. And that's a big, that's a big development. And it just showed that um, there was a lot of consensus between um, just about that this law was not something that they were going to defend once it was challenged in a lawsuit. Um, so two weeks, so that was introduced through a bipartisan effort and then passed. And then as the last step, the case ended um, after the state school board 
uh, repealed a discriminatory regulation, and that was a regulation that required sex ed to promote and honor, to, sorry, to promote honor and respect for monogamous heterosexual marriage. And that was, um, that was related to the, we also challenged the regulation in the lawsuit. So the, the outcome of this is that the state law barrier to inclusive education has finally been removed after all these years, but it still remains up to local school districts now to choose to develop inclusive curricula. And so there's still, um, you know, there's still efforts um, in some districts to develop it and bring it, and those efforts are also being met with opposition. But at least now there's no state law that officially bars um, bars that curriculum. Um, next slide, please. The second case I want to talk about today is um, our case in South Carolina, which we filed earlier this year. It was called Gender and Sexuality Alliance versus Spearman. And um, that challenged a law from 1998 that really prohibited talking about same-sex relationships, except during this instruction on um, STIs. And one important piece of this law is that teachers who violated the law could be fired. And that's a huge consequence. And I think that's why we heard so many examples of students who would just ask questions, like even in terms of talking about healthy relationships, like, oh, like if, if my boyfriend and I, you know, if I have a boyfriend, just the, the kinds of questions that young people would ask, teachers were saying, we can't talk about it, which is really which is really damaging to kids. Um, this also came about um, after a lot of advocacy in South Carolina, in the South, and more generally by students, parents, teachers, and really a wide range of organizations. Uh, the picture on the slide is I'm there with um, Ivy Hill from Campaign for Southern Equality, and we're with Cora Webb and Nigeria Richardson from We Are Family Charleston. And we had an event um, last year to do outreach to students and families to talk about what this law is, how it harms kids, and um, what students could do to make a change, including potentially being involved in a lawsuit. So um, we filed a lawsuit earlier this year. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and the lawsuit was brought by um, three organizations. And the first is the Gender and Sexuality Alliance, which is a high school um, GSA at um, at the School of Arts in Charleston County. And um, Eli Bundy is the president of the GSA. Uh, there are 15, and we worked very closely with Eli um, to, to bring about this case. And um, it's an example of these youth-led efforts to get rid of these harmful and discriminatory laws. We also worked with the South Carolina Equality Coalition and Campaign for Southern Equality. Um, and both of these groups have members who are LGBTQ students in the state who are affected by the law. Um, one important aspect of this is that um, shortly before we filed the lawsuit, the state's attorney general issued an opinion at the request of the superintendent of education um, about this law, saying that they agreed that the law was facially unconstitutional. And that really paved the way to reach a quick resolution of the case. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. And so what the outcome was here was that um, we entered into a consent decree, which is an agreement with the defendant. And that was an agreement to say that the law is unconstitutional and that it can't be enforced again by anyone, um, schools, teachers, um, or, the, or the state. And the judge entered that as an order. So we have an order from the court saying that the law is unconstitutional, can never be enforced by any person. And this, it also requires the state superintendent to update all of the policies and curriculum standards and guidelines, and also notify every district in the state that they can no longer rely on this law. And so um, it's a really exciting development. It also happened very quickly. This was two weeks after the lawsuit is filed. And so, um, it's an example of how sometimes, um, sometimes you need a lawsuit to, to bring about the change, um, but also that you know, the lawsuits don't happen in a, in a vacuum and um, it takes many work over many years for a lot of people to, um, to be doing outreach and education about this law and why, why it is so bad. And so um, I, I see a question in the margin asking about a consent decree would be more 
whether a consent decree would be more advantageous than a repeal. And the answer is just that, um, and that's a, that's a great question. The repeal has to come from the state legislature. So what happened in Utah and Arizona is that the legislature knew about the lawsuits and just decided to get rid of the law to, um, so that the, there would no longer be a reason for the lawsuits. In South Carolina, um, the defendant superintendent of education agreed to enter into a consent decree and so it didn't require the involvement of the legislature in order to make that happen and so the law is still it's technically on the books in south carolina the same way that um like sodomy laws in some states are still on the books but they, but it can't be enforced and there's a judicial order saying that it can't be enforced and that applies um indefinitely into the future with to the superintendent and the successor and the other state officials. So um, I'll end there and um, and we can open it up um, to questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you to all of our amazing panelists. Um, this was super informative um, and I love that we got to end on a really positive note, getting rid of some really awful bills <laughs> and some awful laws that we had on the books. It's incredible. Um, so if you have any questions, we ask that you put them in the Q&A box that's down um, on the right-hand side at the bottom of the screen if you're in Zoom. Um, yep, just add any questions there. I do see that there was one that Anna answered, and I think it would be good to answer it live on the air because it's a really great question that I know I've heard from a lot of my friends doing sex education work. Um, so somebody asked, what's the best way to respond to the argument that men and women are biologically different? Um, and a transgendered individual would have those, quote, biological advantages, end quote, when participating in sports. And Anna gave a really solid answer that I'd love to hear her talk us through. Yes, so of course we heard this, this kind of rebuttal or argument or just concern a lot too. Um, if you look at a lot of the bills, they will actually in the preambles will say, that men and women are different and this is absolutely true ruled by whatever higher power you know like all kinds of different um, statements to that effect so the legislatures are coming in hard on this one too but the thing is i think one of the strongest points really is is that already so many schools states associations um, and so on have been successfully providing trans athletes with equitable access that respects and advances their rights as trans athletes. So in other words, like, you know, you have, for example, that lawsuit that was filed in Connecticut was filed against an association that has an existing anti-trans policy that has had this existing anti-trans policy for any number of years now. Um, so we know that it's possible to keep that level playing field that includes everybody. Um, 25 states already have these kinds of policies that uh, are inclusive of trans athletes and permit trans athletes and peers to participate together, you know, and so on and so forth. The other thing that I think um, might be important to, to integrate into talking about this kind of argument is that uh, to sort of like try to move the focus from competition into participation because theoretically i would hope at least that the the end point of being an athlete and being in sports isn't what the win-lose moment for students it really is often about um it's socialization it is you know for physical health it's for emotional well-being it's to get those lived that experiential learning in terms of like what it is to be a leader and part of a team and so on and so forth so uh, those are you know generally speaking like the approaches that we would take when we were doing testimony and just talking about this in the press and that kind of thing awesome uh, we have another question that I think Julie could probably answer the best. Um, Chris asked, uh, it seems that there are federal, potentially court rulings that would hold that no promo homo laws are illegal, but they're still on the books. Um, so does this mean that court challenges are necessary for getting these laws off the books or repealed? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for asking it. Um, so there are federal court rulings that address 
discrimination based on sexual orientation. Um, and the principles in those case, cases would apply um, to these no promo homo laws, and they were the principles that we relied on in bringing the cases. But there hasn't been a federal court that specifically addressed the constitutionality of these laws. Um, the only court that did so was um, actually in the South Carolina case, the consent decree and judgment, which says they're unconstitutional, is the first time that a federal court is specifically saying that this that this law is unconstitutional. And so I think, um, and so that I would argue that the states in the remaining, the laws in the remaining states that have them are very vulnerable to any sort of court challenge. But um, I think that there would need to be either a repeal uh, by the legislature of those laws or um, a litigation challenge in order to ensure that they couldn't be enforced. Awesome. All right. We still have about 10 more minutes for questions if folks have any, um, so to give people a little bit more time to think through maybe any questions that they have, uh, I'm going to ask a question and I come from a social work background, so it's going to be a little touchy-feely, um, but I think all of us have talked a little bit about just how many resources it takes to do this work at the state level and how it's like hard and demoralizing at times. And so I would love to know from each of you um, how you take care of yourselves um, so that you can keep on doing this work without burning out, hopefully. <laughs> Well, I can I can pipe in, I guess. <laughs> I had to think about that. Um, I, I would just say that I'm I'm so inspired by all the young people and advocates and families and others who we who we work with, which is just a really powerful and constant reminder of of why we do this work. And so I think that to me is really valuable to see um, see so closely what um, how others are so committed to this and also just spending time with uh, my family. And um, I think that a lot of these, these issues really, um, really are about LGBTQ people in, in communities and just ability to go to school, work, thrive, and just live your life. And so I think um, spending time with my family is a good way to think about that. Yeah, sorry for <laughs> pushing you out front, Julie. Um, mostly because, like, you know, I honestly don't know that I've come up with a good kind of answer to this question yet. I don't, I don't, you know, really know that it exists. I would say that, so similar to some of the things that Noel was talking about, and also what Julie just referenced in terms of like, um, you know, standing in alignment, you know, and behind people who are um, choosing to put like their lives and identities on the line, whether it's to testify in court or to testify at the legislature or, you know, to, to march on city hall and what have you is like, I don't understand why I wouldn't do everything that I can <laughs> to, um, to ensure that people have the resources to get to, you know, to, to, to live their fullest lives and voice their needs and concerns in these ways. Like I, I, I truly don't know um, why I wouldn't do what I can to contribute to these efforts and that kind of thing. And I think, you know, some of it, Noel, may be similar to you is that I come from a lot of work doing um, direct services and direct support and mutual aid for people who have experienced both interpersonal and state violence. Um, and so, yeah, just sort of, it, it's a solidarity thing for me, I think. Um, and yeah, I feel like that's such a sad answer that it's the work that keeps me going and doing the work, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's the best answer. <laughs> oh man, I don't have that much else to add. I agree. Like, I truly can't think of a better reason to do this work than why wouldn't you? Why would you not want to make systems better and stand in solidarity with folks? Um, and I also, I recharge by reaching out to family, um, reaching out to my communities to recharge and remind myself again and again why I'm here doing these things. Um, I don't see any other questions, so let's give back folks some of their time today. 
Um, thank you again to our truly fantastic panelists. You all have so much wisdom and just excellence to share with us. And I'm so privileged, or I feel so privileged that I was able to share this space with you all today. Um, we'll be back at the same place, same time tomorrow. That's 2 p.m. Eastern time to talk more about local policy. Um, so school districts, what they can do to start implementing better sex ed for all folks. Um, and thank you all again. Yeah, if you want to shout out our panelists in the chat, go for it. We love seeing it. Um, and thank you all so much for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you, panelists and people attending. I feel like there's so much competition for your online attention. <laughs> I'm just really happy that you were here. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. Thank you very much.